Hey everybody, welcome to the second mini lecture for the week. Uh, the mini lecture on the uh, reconstruction programs of Abraham Lincoln and Andrew Johnson. The previous mini lecture looked at the Republican plan for economic growth, which depended on widespread industrialization and Western settler colonialism. This one's going to briefly cover the election of 1864, the assassination of Lincoln and the presidency of Johnson, uh, presidential reconstruction, and then congressional reconstruction. And I have a third mini lecture this week that's going to look at the reconstruction amendments, the Freedmen's Bureau, and military reconstruction in the South. In 1864, Lincoln was not optimistic about his chances for re-election. He recommended that his staff polish up their resumes because they'd probably be out of a job soon. His first turn at the presidency had brought forth a secessionist war over whether or not owning human beings was cool, and the war hadn't gone without controversy. A major push for a military draft had led to an urban insurrection in New York City uh, aimed at draft resistance, and the Union Army briefly occupied the city after shelling it and landing troops. General McClellan, who Lincoln had removed from command of the Union Army due to a string of defeats and missed opportunities, was running on the Democratic ticket against him. Abraham Lincoln recruited Andrew Johnson as his running mate in order to draw the Northern Democratic votes into his National Union Party ticket. Johnson was from Tennessee, and he had owned slaves, and had served in the State House and State Senate before getting elected to governor. He was serving as one of Tennessee's senators when the state seceded, but he was the only senator from the South not to resign his seat. By 1862, the Union Army had driven the Confederate Army out of Tennessee, and Lincoln appointed Johnson as the military governor of the conquered state. Now, in general, the office of the vice president is not a very powerful office. It holds very little responsibility, and many vice presidents often view their tenure as a journey into the political wilderness. It's also a generally good place to park a troublesome politician, whose name is more valuable than their actual political power. It made political sense for Lincoln to choose Johnson to secure Northern Democrat, the Northern Democratic vote. And Lincoln and Johnson won the election pretty strongly, as you can see from the electoral map. They obliterated McClellan in the Electoral College and took 45% of the popular vote. Or, I'm sorry, uh... And they won 55% of the popular vote, with McClellan won for, winning 45%. McClellan won New Jersey and Kentucky. Well, Lincoln took every other voting state that was not in the Confederacy. Abe Lincoln assumed the presidency for his second term on March 4th, 1865. The Civil War was coming to a quick end, and Ulysses Grant had accepted the surrender of Robert E. Lee and the Confederate Army, the Army of the Potomac, on April 9th. Historian Eric Foner argues that, quote, Unlike Sumner and the other radicals, Sumner being a senator, Lincoln did not see rec Reconstruction as an opportunity for sweeping political and social revolution beyond emancipation. He had long made clear his opposition to the confiscation and redistribution of land. He believed, as most Republicans did in April 1865, that the voting requirements should be determined by the states. He assumed that political control in the South would pass to white Unionists, reluctant secessionists, and forward-looking former Confederates. But time and time again during the war, Lincoln, after initial opposition, had come to embrace positions first advanced by abolitionists and radical Republicans. 
Lincoln undoubtedly would have listened carefully to the outcry for further protection for former slaves. It is entirely plausible to imagine Lincoln and Congress agreeing on a reconstruction policy that encompassed federal protection for basic civil rights plus limited black suffrage all along the lines that Lincoln proposed just before his death. Lincoln never got the chance to preside over the peace. The Confederacy had surrendered on April 9th. On Good Friday, April 14th, five days after, Lincoln went to watch a play at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. During the performance, John Wilkes Booth, a Confederate sympathizer and semi-famous actor with contacts in the Confederate intelligence apparatus, snuck into Lincoln's presidential viewing booth and shot him in the back of the head. Lincoln died a few hours later. Andrew Johnson, the man who held strong sympathies for the defeated Confederacy and the institutions of slavery and white supremacy, was sworn in to replace the great emancipator. Johnson would later be impeached and nearly removed from office, avoiding removal by only one vote in the Senate. Lincoln's assassination and Johnson's presidency mark what historians refer to as presidential reconstruction. Johnson's primary goal was the rapid reconstitution of the United States, regardless of the bellicose activities of the South. Under Johnson's plan, all that was necessary for reincorporation in the Federation was for Confederate states and leaders to swear an oath to the U.S. Constitution repeal the state's documents of secession, and send representatives back to con Congress. Now, that seems pretty easy, almost easy enough that any state which seceded and part sparked a war that killed 2% of the population could probably do it. As an added bonus to the leaders of the former Confederacy, whose military had just suffered an anonymous defeat, and who had just felt the weight of industrialized total war with Sherman's brutal march of the sea, Johnson encouraged the development of Southern Black Codes. The Black Codes were laws in the South that restricted African American civil liberties. They restricted them from owning firearms, violating their Second Amendment rights, from owning dogs, which violates pretty much every norm of basic decency, from owning property, which is violating the rights outlined in the preamble of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and from traveling without a pass or authorization, a further violation of their civil rights. People found to be in violation of these black codes could be forced back into a state of unfree labor. But, as the Constitution at the time of Johnson's presidency was still technically okay with slavery, the Black Codes were an efficient legal strategy for enforcing white supremacy. African Americans, therefore, existed in a twilight zone between slavery and freedom at this time. The United States Congress, a co-equal branch of government to the executive, objected to Johnson's plan for Reconstruction. At the time, Congress is dominated by Northern Republicans, again, because the South had chosen to, to fight a rebellion over whether or not owning humans was cool. The fact that Johnson was welcoming representatives from the states that many Northerners considered to be traitors and enemies was intolerable to Congress. As the representatives from the South attempted to join Congress, the Northern representatives refused them to refuse to allow them to be seated using procedural tools. Johnson's attempt to force Congress to accept his plan for reconstruction met the Republicans in Congress, who viewed the Southern representatives as treasonous, hostile, and defeated. Why should they seat them on equal terms? After Johnson's attempt at rapprochement with the former slave owning Confederacy, Congress stopped his plans with their own strategies in this little process called impeachment. 
In the third mini lecture for this week, I'm going to talk about the reconstruction of management. But for now, let's talk briefly about Congress's plan for reconstruction. Congress moved to order the United States Army, the largest apparatus of the federal government, to continue its occupation of the South and it divided the South into five military districts. The military government dissolved the state governments in the occupied districts and ordered the drafting of a new state constitution by conventions made up of both black and white men and approved by the U.S. Congress. In these state constitutions, the former Confederates had to ratify the Reconstruction Amendments as condition of readmission into the Union, which as provisions banned slavery and guaranteed voting rights and equal protection to all men. I'm going to wrap up this mini lecture right here and we'll pick it up in the third mini lecture which covers military reconstruction and the Freedmen's Bureau.